Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you may know, we are doing a study of the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is for the third set of three months in the year of 2013. And this series is entitled Revival and Reformation. This particular lesson is lesson number 11 for September 14 of 2013. And it is entitled Reformation, Thinking New Thoughts. I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look at a number of Bible verses and we want to make sure that we're not quoting them incorrectly and you can check on us. But if, in case you're interested, the materials we use to uh, encourage our discussions here are available on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G theox.org and you can uh, look at the handouts that we prepare for this series of lessons. This lesson is about overcoming sin. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, sin is such an enormous factor here on planet Earth. How can we even talk about overcoming it? And yet, we believe that the time will come, it must come, when a group of your friends here on this earth will indeed overcome sin. And by that, of course, we mean that Satan will no longer be able to take us by the nose and lead us where he wants us to go. Uh, the time is coming when we will be able to stand up and say, Satan, I will not believe your lies. I choose rather to believe the truth about God as presented in Scripture. May each one of us come closer to that experience as a result of our time together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Overcoming sin, how do we do it? Does this mean thinking right thoughts? Reformation. Reformation. Uh, does that involve actions or thinking or both? Of course, you can't have actions without thinking, right? But it's also true that repeated actions will affect our thinking. So, Christians who hope to be a part of the new kingdom of God must learn to think in new ways. And the way to learn to think new thoughts is by practice. And this famous quotation we have quoted many times, it is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. By beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated. What does assimilated mean? Brought in. A part of. It becomes a part of. It just melts into something. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt a man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. And that, of course, those, of course, are the words of Ellen White, The Great Controversy, page 555, in the first paragraph. So, if we want to be like Jesus, what do we have to do? Focus on his life, fill our minds with his thoughts and ideas, guide our actions by imitating him, and thus be... Uh, Behold our only safe guide. This phrase here adapts itself to the subjects on which it is allowed to dwell. Mm -hmm. That implies time, does mm -hmm. it not? In our culture, where do we spend more time? <laughs> Watching TV or beholding the Christ who died for us? Well... Because we're going to become like the thing we spend the most time with. The more we study him, the more interesting he will become. 
And that's part of the, that's probably maybe the biggest problem. Yeah. We, don't, we have a hard time getting started. I find that the more I study about the life of Christ, the more I read my Bible, the more interesting it becomes. Mm. And the less time I spend watching movies, the less time I spend watching TV, the less interesting it becomes. That's right. Yeah. So, and so these words from Ellen White, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. How, how do we do that? I want to ask Gary a question. Okay. Would you expand uh, and your, your understanding of take each point and let the imagination grasp each scene? How would, that, how would you do that? What, what, what would it look like? What would it feel like? Well, I would think you put Christ in the context of your life also. So I would say that the context of your life it's put together with Christ, and that's how your imagination puts it together. So I, I, I would do the opposite of that. I would say you need to put yourself in Christ's life. You need to imagine what it would be like to be walking behind him on the dusty roads of Galilee, standing beside him as he performs miracles, that sort of stuff. But that's imagination. Well, what, what you do here is, about. is when you really walk down a road, that's you walking, mm -hmm. and you need to put Christ with you as you're walking mm -hmm. The statement along. says, so we were discussing this statement, and the statement says, and let the imagination grasp. And it talks about in contemplation of the life of Christ. So, sure, eventually we need to do what you're talking about, but I think for the first step we need to say, okay, here I am, I'm following Jesus. What am I seeing here? What would I do? How would I feel? How would I respond if I were here when he's saying, roll back the stone, Lazarus, come forth? The kind of imagination I'm envisioning, I'm not very good at it, but, but you, you want to hear the sounds. You, you have tonal memories that you can recall. Hear the sounds or imagine the sounds that you would hear during this scene. Uh, Smell the smells that you would have, that your imagination brings to this scene that you're reading about. Get in, in other words, get involved with it at a at a very sensual level. And, and but and, that's yeah, the same description that people use when they're talking about contemplative prayer. Mm -hmm. No, that's quite different. The difference is you are bringing to your thoughts, your imagination, your mind is active in bringing these things up. In contemplative prayer, your job is to have no thoughts, to eliminate your thoughts so that some other thoughts can come in by another power. It's the exact opposite of what this is talking about. Well, it kind of reminds me of what Paul said in Galatians, where wasn't Christ crucified before you, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I don't know if they were actually on the wall watching him or if he was talking about where you imagined it, yeah. you know, type of thing. He, he, he's, Paul is saying, I presented that story to you in the most vivid language I could possibly present to you. Don't you remember it? Mm -hmm. don't, didn't you see it when I was there with you? So how would you apply this to... Um, um, reading the Old Testament. Well, I, I think the same, I believe that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament just as he is the person of the New Testament. And, and I have very, I mean, that's what, the, that's what he himself said. So I have to, when I, when I get a little bit comfortable with doing it in the Gospels, I need to go back to Mount Sinai, I need to go back to the Old Testament. I say, okay, that same Jesus is right here why did he do this in this way? How would I respond as he's drowning everybody in a flood? How would I respond as he's killing the firstborn in Egypt? Those are a little bit tougher stories, but that's the same Jesus, and we cannot leave that out of our picture. Absolutely not. It has to be part of the whole picture. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to say, 
boy, I, I won't worship a God who doesn't zap people. No, it means that we need to, we need to say, okay, why did he do that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We got in taking it point by point. Uh, I went to see uh, di I went to see the movie um, Passion uh, of Christ. Yes, and I was so sick. I mean, when if you truly let yourself really feel all this, your heart cannot take it. Mm -hmm. It's it's more than you can stand. But but get your what you're seeing comes from what you're studying, what you're reading in, in the scripture and in Ellen White, not out of a movie DV, out of a movie yeah. scene, because the stuff that they're showing there probably didn't happen. You want to be imagining what is going on yeah. here. But it, the, 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 that's, that, you know, that story about the, the crucifixion of Christ is yeah. probably yeah. less terrible than it actually was. I mean, as bad as it is. I, mean, I, I, I won't deny yeah. that. Yeah. I have a favorite text, and that is uh, Romans uh, 5.10. We are reconciled by his death, but we are saved or healed by his life. Mm -hmm. And that, to, the way I interpret that is study his life. And what did he do? He spent his time teaching. Mm -hmm. And our, our process is to learn from our Creator. Mm -hmm. And to learn, if we understand that sin is a disease, Jesus God, Yahweh, says back in Exodus 15, 26, I'm your healer. Mm -hmm. I can restore you. Or I will restore you. All through the Old Testament, that's what he says. I'll heal you. I'll restore you. And that's, at least it's a pretty basic foundation for, for the way I approach things. I, I like what you said. It starts with some reading, with some knowledge, with some gaining some information. But then comes restoration. Then come changes on the inside that are, that are identifiable. To quote Heppenstall, you crowd out the stuff that, you, that, that is it, it making you sick in your life, and, uh, mentally and emotionally and well, physically. Here's, here's, here's the problem. We do not have time at this point in the world's history to be filling our minds full of entertainment's trash. The world we live in is full of trash, and we just can't spend. But how many people around you? I mean, if you go to a typical gathering of people, what are they talking about? The latest movie. And it's full of junk. It's full of trash. Now, how do you reconcile that with, with Paul walking up in, what was it, Mars Hill? Mm -hmm. What was he doing there? I mean, well, why should he, he be spending his time up there? I mean, it's all pagan stuff. Well, but he, well, but what, what's he trying? He's not trying to present, uh, promote paganism. He's trying to say, is it possible to meet these guys who are at the highest intellectual level? Is it possible for them to meet, to meet them with the truths of the gospel and impact them? That's what he was trying to find out. And, and wasn't that's, there an amphitheater that's what, there that, and that's well, where they kind of did it? Yeah, Probably well, that's not. what I'm saying, though. It is possible to actually know about these movies and whatever because these people all know about them. Mm -hmm. And you can start talking in, uh, you know, yeah. in their language since they know this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So just to say that stay away from movies is, yeah. is not exactly... Well, but here's um, the problem. To a greater or less extent, Everything we take into our minds impacts our characters. Okay, so why didn't that impact Paul when he was going up it did. walking? Oh, it did. Yeah. And what did he do? He said, that didn't work so well. Let me go somewhere else and try something a little different. Wh yeah. What do you mean? He, he said, when he got to Corinth, he said, I determined not to try that routine. I'm going to try. I'm going to go down here to Corinth and I'm going I'm to talk. I'm going to focus on... Christ and Him crucified only. But that, those words that he had to teach only fell on ears that weren't satisfied with their pos position that, uh, that they were in their own lives. Because if people are satisfied, how are you going to break through? Yeah. You can't. And, and if we think we can break through, I think we're getting a little arrogant, really. It's the Holy Spirit. But, uh, but He has us as, as a vehicle. Mm -hmm. But uh, if their people are satisfied economically, physically, socially, mentally, mm -hmm. where they're at, why change? Mm -hmm. But you'll never know whether they're satisfied no. unless you present it. That's right. If you tell them, 
and they're satisfied, they make their choice, that's not your business what they mm -hmm. do with it. But it is our business to present it so that they can make a choice. Like the Jesus says, go out there to the, to the village just when you set the disciples out. And if they won't listen, well, dust your shows, shoes off and go to the next yeah, town. Exactly. Philippians 4, these two very important verses. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Boy, try to find something like that on TV. <laughs> Why? Why try? <laughs> just well, stay away. <laughs> just to prove that you can. An exercise. An exercise. Romans 12, too, has something similar. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. So, what about it? Our world is full of violence, immorality, greed, materialism, and we could go on and on. Each of those things has a certain appeal. I mean, we, we know that there's appealing forces there. Hollywood has mastered the science of manipulating people's minds. Surely they have taught us that we cannot believe what we see. Billions of dollars are spent by media producers to discover the latest sensation, including new ways to manipulate our emotions, condition our thinking, and shape our values. Can people who are preparing to spend eternity in heaven be filling their minds with that kind of material? I mean, I'm not just specifically attacking movies, but I'm saying we need to think about what we're watching. How do we control the avenues of the soul? What is the secret of letting in only the good? Surely we all recognize that we are surrounded by a cesspool, which the world calls entertainment. Almost everyone around us seems to be motivated by pleasure-seeking, greed, anger, hate, or resentment. One of the most noteworthy sayings of Billy, Graham, of Billy Graham says, you cannot stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. <laughs> okay, is that what Paul meant when he said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus? Do we have a choice of what we're gonna what we're gonna watch, what we're gonna hear, what we're gonna think about, what we're gonna dwell on. We do. If you don't want the devil's wares, you don't go into his shop. Yeah. I think that's in the end times when the false Christ are coming and it says if they say he's out on the desert, don't go. Yeah. And they find him in the in the say he's in a little hidden room someplace, don't go. Yeah. And I, I think that's how you control some of this. You, you just don't go where it is. We need to become more practiced, more efficient in studying Christ, practicing thinking like Christ, even acting like Christ. Oh, what what, 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 what yeah. would happen? Yeah? I, I apologize for interrupting. No. But you know, regarding television, I think that there's some wonderful things on. We're the on television. Nature Not programs, everything's bad, this I hope. show, other shows that that are done here. Um, but I noticed something. I can be watching a show about animals in the wild. Suddenly, the commercial comes on, mm -hmm. and I have children, and it's sometimes it's very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I feel ashamed. The commercial is so aggressive with things that we should not even know about mm -hmm. and now today young children know these things mm -hmm. things that I as a boy maybe didn't know till I was in my late teens yeah so it's very dangerous even if we're watching something good you know suddenly a commercial will come on unexpectedly that we you know could be very shocking yeah yeah well Plato and the ancient Greeks believed in a dualistic world, even a dualistic universe. They thought that everything material, anything you can touch and hold on, even human beings, I got two of them beside me here, anything you can touch is evil. 
Only what's ethereal, what you can't touch, is good. But the scriptures never agrees with that. The scripture teaches that we are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual beings. Whatever affects one part of us affects our whole being, and Paul put it in these words in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God who gives us peace make you holy in every part, I'm sorry, in every way, and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how much of us is involved in this process of salvation? Every part of us. So why, for example, should we practice health reform? Look at a, look at a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 6. Now you've gone to meddling. Now I've gone to meddling. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who, gives you, who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves but to God. He bought you for a price. So use your bodies for God's glory. Use what for God's glory? Our bodies. Try verse 10. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 31. Still 1 Corinthians. Well then, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, is that talking about physical realities? It is, isn't it? Whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. Okay, one more. Look at Romans 12, 2 and 3. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly, we read this just a moment ago, by a complete change of your mind, then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. And because of God's gracious gift to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking, judge yourself according to the amount of faith that God has given you. So, God has purchased us with an incredible price. He cares about every aspect of our beings. Living a healthy lifestyle means much more than having a few extra years of life on this earth. The most important reason, reason for living a healthy lifestyle is so that our thinking will be more clear and our resolutions more firm in practicing our Christianity. In fact, caring for our bodies can be an act of worship. And that's, of course, Romans 12, 2 and 3, or 1 and 2, really. Jesus repeatedly referred to himself as light. What do you think he was trying to imply? Light. So you can see. We, mm -hmm. When we're in the dark, we bang into things and we hurt ourselves and we bounce around on things we don't want to. Light gives us the opportunity to avoid those things. And what does God, I mean, what did Jesus say we are supposed to be? Light in the world. You are like the light, Matthew 5, 14, 15, and 16. You are like the light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Wow. If we were to live lives like the life of Jesus in our world today, do you think people would notice? I <laughs> think they'd try to send us to the funny farm? <laughs> Well, I, I suspect that ultimately there'll be that much contrast between uh, God's people and the world that they will be trying to do damage to them and get them out of the way. And maybe the funny farm isn't the worst thing they'd be thinking of. Would people notice if we practiced loving, compassionate, caring lives instead of acting like the selfish, greedy, and egotistical people of the world? Yes. We live in a world intoxicated with pleasure. Dennis. Yeah, Ellen White had some very almost caustic words when she talks about 
if Jesus were to come in our day in his humble manner, mm -hmm. that we as the church would be the first to cry, crucify him, crucify him. Of course Whoa. we'll be different. But Christ calls us, this is from our adult Sabbath school Bible well, study guy. Deal with that just a okay. little bit. I, I don't think yeah. we should just run away from that. How is that possible? In, in what area are we so deluded that we could come to that, that we would do that? Let's assume that the statement is right. He, then then he, wh he, where have we gone? Here, here's the problem. Even in the days of Jesus, it will be the same today. Someone living that kind of life makes us very uncomfortable. Not and those of how, us not how, those of us at this table. How no. would <laughs> it's how those, it's, those of us know, saints it's, we're fine. Right? Christian church is large. Okay. Well that's my definition of fire. It's yes. a fire that comes from God. Uh, okay. You just are not comfortable with him. Mm hmm Yeah. Well God calls us to healthful living at a time when millions are dying too young from self-inflicted degenerative diseases. In the midst of an immodest, sex-centered, jaded generation, Jesus calls us to something different. He calls us to modesty, propriety, and moral purity. Is that possible in the 21st century, living in our world? Well, create in me a clean heart. And when that happens, I think that's exactly what will go on. Is it not? Should be. Is your correct question directed to, to, to quote, us? Or is it directed to... Well, not to us saints. <laughs> is... Yeah, to us saints. Is, is, is that something that is directed to the individual? Mm -hmm. Does an individual assume that it is possible to live a life like that, but he may be all alone? Uh, and, and therefore... Well, this is what Isaiah said about it. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not like yours. My ways are different from yours. Well, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. Well, but last, last week and part of this session, we've talked about all we have to do mm -hmm. to have our, our thoughts like his thought and his thoughts like ours are just read and expose and make sure okay. he's our friend. So that doesn't apply to me. I see. Because you see, and... I'm, I'm doing all of that. So wh how do I take a statement like that? What? I read that over and over and all the time and think, well, it, you know, it's just keep flailing myself with that statement or? Well, let, 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 me, you, let me try another quotation from Ellen White. <laughs> I, I've, I've done more than, more than my share of talking here. God's ideal for his children. That means what he wants for us is higher than the highest human thought can reach. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And of course that's Matthew 5, 48. This command is a what? A promise. In other words, how are we going to accomplish this? God is going to help us. He's promised it. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Complete recovery from the power of Satan. Last week we talked about, you know, we could reach the place where when doing the will of Christ we would be carrying out our own impulses. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was Desire of Ages 668. He came, Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul and to keep him from sinning. Desire of Ages Now, page 311, paragraph 2. And another spot, slightly different, higher than the human, highest human thought can reach, is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness, 
is the goal to be reached. Is that possible for a human being in the 21st century? Is there any next to Enoch and Jesus? Elijah. And maybe Elijah. Is well, there, out of all those people in the Old Testament and, and Peter and all of the bungles that he made in the New Testament, there, there, give us some people who accomplished that. I mean, yeah. it, would be a, it would be a I, common understanding that we've got probably millions there that didn't accomplish it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that's the odds that there are going to be millions that didn't quite do it, but eh, we've sneaked in a few here, and that's the way it's going to be at the end of time. I, and I, I, would, I, would, I would venture to say that probably every one of the disciples and the rest of those people, the 120 in the upper room, probably came close. And I would How say, why are we even asking that question? Comparing one human with another human with another human with me is not our job. Our job is to look at Christ and compare ourselves with him. And if you think you've made that, that's then continue what, to talk. That's true. That's what it <laughs> says there. Yeah. I want to know if what it says there is true. That's why I, I asked the I question. Do I'm I looking do, for evidence. I do believe it's true. And that's because the Holy Spirit is impressing you. But perhaps the Holy Spirit is impressing me to ask this question. <laughs> I, I imagine that there, there are several million, millions of people who are very close with the Lord. I, I recall Elijah said, Lord, it's only me. I'm the only one left. And how many thousands did the Lord say? 7,000? So don't that's a big think? difference between one and 7,000. So today, I, with these billions, I believe that there must be millions and millions who God, God says, wow, the last in this of, day and age, with the TV, with the internet, with the magazines, with the schools, with the kids, and the bad conversation between each other, the language, wow, there are still millions out there who are following me, the Lord. So. I think that there are millions and millions. Before the student, I continue to read education, page 18. Before the student, there is opened a path of continual progress. He has an object to achieve, a standard to attain that includes everything good and pure and noble. I mean, when students start out in education, do we expect them to make progress? Do we expect them to learn something? He will advance as fast and as far as possible in every branch of true knowledge. But his efforts will be directed to objects as much higher than mere selfish and temporal interests as the heavens are higher than the earth. You Education. Know, we're we're kind of throwing out the proposition that we're going to make it to that point. I don't think we're going to make it to that point. I think that is the trip to eternity right there is to get closer and closer to God, to be more and more like Him. That's the whole purpose of living, as far as I'm concerned. And to say that in this time, in this world, that we're going to obtain it, well then, what else is there after mm -hmm. that? So I think it's, it, what we're talking about is something that we start here, mm -hmm. and we start continuing doing it for eternity. And it's just going to be that way. And, I don't, and, and that's such a that's such a lofty, a lofty uh, level of uh, almost perfection there. And uh, somehow I think there are some different levels down here that uh, you that we should be happy with. Well, it's not a it's not a it's it's the highest level that. Every, everybody has a different level that's their highest. And when you read that, it's like, you know, this is the PhD up here. And there's just a lot of people, a lot of us that aren't much going to get much past, you know, our own level of the first grade. And when we always targeting this PhD thing up here, and I just wonder. Well, no. There's only one thing, and, and you know what? The whole the Old Testament is just filled with all of this. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to. 
and it just never came to be. And the, about the only thing that's ever really been fulfilled is Jesus showing up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we've got his promise, all these promises, and, and someday that's going to be fulfilled too. But uh, Here, here's, here's, here's my response to that, and, and you can think about it. Maybe there are some people who need to be PhDs, and there's some people who will be masters, and there's some people who will be college grads, and there's some people who will be high school grads, and there's some people who will be in the first grade. But each one of those people, if he believes these words, is striving, and he's getting as far as he can go. I That's think, what God asks of us. I think a, a very modern example of that would be Desmond Doss. Mm -hmm. He was a very, uh, a very simple man. I mean, this would be my understanding. A very simple man. But it was in his intent always to do the right thing. And his experience during World War II, it was always his intent, uh, and I heard him speak many times, he never, he always, whenever he spoke, God hath done this, not me. Hmm. And I think God knew that, that this very simple man, and I think God likes to work with simple people, some of the simplest even uh, some fishermen and a tax collector. Right, right. But I, I, don't, I, I don't like to paint God like this. It's almost like he likes to show off. He likes to take these people and show off what he can do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's and not a, a very that's good thing great. to do. great. That is the most wonderful thing that I can imagine, that God can take mm -hmm. this whatever, however low it is, and make it into exactly what he wants it to be. The only, the only problem with that is Ellen White says, in the ordinary walks of life, there are people walking around that are like those disciples who could be among the greatest men in the world. And that's basically she says. In other words, what she's really saying is, if we give God the opportunity to work in our lives, as we're suggesting here, yes. it's amazing what God should do. We might even be like, well, we might even be as good as one of those fishermen. Or, you know... With no education. Um, or maybe like a little lady who had the third grade education. Or like Moses, who had tremendous talent. The impact that he has made doing the same thing that I'm saying Desmond Doss did. The greater talents that you have, the more God is able to make your life an impact in the world around you. Do our co-workers and those who associate with us on a day-by-day -day basis recognize that we're different than a typical worldling? More than you realize. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, and I, I, I don't like to make myself an example in any way, but unfortunately I had Adventist parents. I grew up in an Adventist home. I've been a vegetarian all my life. I run lots of marathons and those kind of stuff. And my patients, who obviously haven't had those kind of lives, come into me at the clinic and they say, Doc, what are you doing? Every time we come in here, you look younger. <laughs> Serious, I had a lot of my patients, Doc, what are you doing? Every time we come in here, you look younger. Now, I don't know, there's nothing special that I do, but it tells you something about the way people are looking in the world. Mm -hmm. Think about the record that you're producing in the books of heaven. If you could go to heaven when your case comes up, and you could stand and listen to God talk about you, and you listen to the devil talk about you, do you think you could vote for yourself when you were done? No. <laughs> if, if you look at yourself, no. Somebody else However, is, somebody else is this, this looking. He, God looks down the future mm -hmm. and sees what you will become and then takes that image and sees it as accomplished in the present. Mm -hmm. If that's true, I could vote for me. Okay. Well, again, for Ellen White, many profess to be on the Lord's side, but they are not. The weight of all their actions is on Satan's side. By, by what means shall we determine whose side we are on? Who has, a, who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Upon whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? 
If we are on the Lord's side, our thoughts are with Him, and our sweetest thoughts are of Him. We have no friendship with the world. We have consecrated all that we have and are to Him. Mm. We long to bear His image, breathe His Spirit, do His will, and please Him in all things. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 262. Isn't there some passages that describe some people like that at the end of time who felt that way about themselves? And then uh, even, they even do miracles. And then Jesus says, uh, well, you thought you were. You thought you were on my side, but you really weren't. I, I know you not. So mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I know I'm not going to be one of those? I'm, I'm doing well, all of some, this. Sometimes the counterfeit is <coughs> a lot like the truth. So I would like to suggest to all of us here and see what you think of this. God is in desperate need of friends. He is doing his best to make us his friends. And he wants us to help make other friends for him as well. How do I know that? It says so in the Bible. I read 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 18. Now this is the Good News Bible, which is a little different than what your translation might say. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us a task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. How many people his friends? All. Oh. The whole human race through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells us how he makes them his friends. What does he want us to do? He wants us to be recruiting friends for him. And how do we do that? We get to be his friend first. That's right, by being friends. It must have been from the beginning because he came down to talk to Adam and Eve. Yeah. I don't think he would have done that if he had something else that interested him more. Be honest with yourself. Does the life which you live match the claims that you make? The only way we will ultimately overcome temptation is through the Holy Spirit's help in making conscious choices at the moment of temptation to set our minds on the things we should. Many Christians down through the generations have discovered that one cannot stamp out sin, one can only crowd it out by filling his or her mind with better things. How, how would you respond to a fellow Christian who says, I can't seem to control my thoughts, and they're not always perfect, but my actions and lifestyle are above, above reproach? Is that fine? Is that okay? Sounds a little pharisaical. <laughs> Dangerous ground. Sounds like he doesn't understand physiology. I see. What's the definition of a bad thought? Something that leads us in the path towards Satan. Whatsoever is not of faith <coughs> is a bad thought. What was that again? Whatsoever is not of faith is a bad thought. Oh, okay. So faith has to be in there somewhere. Sure it does. Right. Our relationship to Jesus Christ. Whatever doesn't bring us closer to Christ is bringing us closer to the devil. I'm sorry, I'm not, not, not pointing at you. <laughs> that was not intentional at all. Yeah, dodge a here. I'm, I'm, I, you two Next need to change you places. <laughs> what about our health message? In addition to our wonderful understanding of Scripture and the great controversy theme, I mean, we as Adventists have been blessed and blessed and blessed with all this information that's so helpful. We have been given precious truth regarding living a healthy lifestyle. Millions of dollars, U.S. government dollars have been spent on research demonstrating that those who carefully follow the advice given us by Ellen White, now that's not the way they understand it, but that's what we research has showed, will live 10 to 12 years longer. And those extra 10 to 12 years are not the feeble years added on at the end of life living in a nursing home. The 10 to 12 extra years that are added are at the best times in our lives. The period of infirmity and deterioration at the end will be shortened. 
Shouldn't we all want that? And if we practice our health message, our minds will be clearer, which is the most important part, to comprehend and live out the truths we claim to believe. Wow. You know, I've dropped the ball. I have experienced. Pick it up again. Stop and pick it up again. I, I've experienced people that have taken the health message so far that they don't even speak about Jesus anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, well, th we all have to be careful about that because um, that's this is very valuable. <laughs> yeah. We, we all should value health reform, but th the reason for the health reform is so we can right. study Jesus, have a clear mind, right. and um, <clears throat> be able to... Converse with others about Jesus. Right, yeah. right. I knew an a Adventist lady. I, I had only met her twice in my life. Brief, brief time, like just maybe an hour each time. And, then I, and I lived overseas for a long, long time almost uh, two decades, I came back one time to visit and it was this lady's 100th birthday. Mm. And her birthday party was at a local church right over here on the hill. And uh, I went to visit her for her birthday and she adhered to the health message. And as I made my way past the very, it was in their little gymnasium or multi-purpose room. Yeah hundred people or, or more there as I made my way through to get to the stage to greet her. She saw me from a distance. I'd only met her twice, mm. about an hour each time, and she said, oh, hi, Ken. This is her hundredth birthday. She has over a hundred visitors there. Her mind was very sharp, and I've met many, many people in this community whose minds are very sharp. It must be to the health message and you know, good, mm -hmm. clean living and being close to Jesus. Well, the 11 disciples lived through that absolutely, and Norm talked about this earlier, about that obs absolutely incredible weekend we call the crucifixion weekend. But when they realized Jesus was indeed fully God and that he rose from the dead, they went forth with one goal in mind, and that was to tell the whole world. What percentage of our time is spent in telling the world? If someone were to carefully chronicle the details of your life, what would, would, would spreading the gospel be shown to rate high on your list of priorities? What percentage of your time would be spent spreading the gospel? Well, I think it would have helped me if I could have experienced what they would have experienced. I, I think I'd be a little different than I am now. That's what we were talking about earlier. We said, read the story. Put yourself into the story. Think about what, what you would, that's what you're supposed to do with that story. Do you think that that'll take that place of actually being there? Best you can do. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that because I'm not traveling the world or, well, I guess I'm doing my part in this program going all over the world, but physically, because mm -hmm. I can't travel all over the world that uh, I'm not doing my part um, or that I'm not even having a global impact. I'm the, the few people that I may contact, for example, I may impact those lives in mm -hmm. such a way so that, you know, they spread yeah. the mesh up far. So some, some people, you know, about all they do is make money, but when they contribute their funds to I'll say the church in this mm -hmm. example here, that provides uh, uh, a tangible resource that does the very thing only in a different way. There's a story told, and I may not have all the details exactly right, but it goes something like this. There was a gentleman who traveled to Ireland, and he was determined, a pastor, and he was determined to go there and hold an evangelistic series in Ireland and really make an impact on the community. And he, he went all out. He, had, he spent quite a lot of money. He talked with a lot of people and so forth and got a lot of help and so forth. And at the end of that series of meetings, he baptized one person. And he thought, man, with all that effort, I baptized one person. That person ended up being the grandfather of Billy Graham. 
Did it make a difference yeah. that, he, that he went and did all that? So it's not, it's not our job to judge how successful or not successful we are. Now, this doesn't mean we should do crazy things. We, we need to be sensible in our efforts. If we see something is not working, maybe we try something a little different. But it's not our job to say, well, yeah, here we are. These people are here successful, and those people are not successful, or we're not successful, and so forth. No, we need to do what we can do and leave the rest with God. And trust that uh, God will, um, he will bless our efforts. Yeah. May not be able to see it by our measurement, but mm -hmm. one of the, somehow in my experience, I've come to the conclusion that uh, God is just and he is faithful. Mm -hmm. And when you give to him, whatever you give to him, he, he multiplies that. Yeah. The two mites, I think, are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. The lady who put in a little bit, but what an influence she has had since mm -hmm. that time. You give it to him and, yeah. and leave it to him, and, uh, and you can trust without question. And there are people who say, you know, why did she waste her money? Where did that money go to? It ended up in the hands of a couple of Sadducees who probably threw it over the back fence. What do they care about those two mites? And there are people who say, well, I don't like the way something the church is doing with its money, so therefore I'm not going to contribute. What did Jesus say about that woman? She gave more than all the rest. And did he know where that money was going to go? Sure. Of course. So it's not our job to decide, okay, I'm not going to give my offerings, I'm not going to pay my tithe because somebody over here is not doing what I want them to do. No. Are you giving it to the church or are you giving it to God? Yeah, that's the question. And I move on. Another quotation from Ellen White. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. We, we've talked about this before, but I think this one absolutely bears repeating. Maybe we ought to memorize it. So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it, as it is our privilege to know him, Gary, as it, our, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. If we know him as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. That means if we really get to know God, the impact of knowing God will do what to us? Our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Another paragraph in volume 8, <clears throat> page 289. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. It is the knowledge that works transformation of character. This knowledge received will recreate the soul in the image of God. It will impart to the whole being a spiritual power that is divine. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a story told about a gentleman his name was William Dunn Longstaff. He was a Christian businessman living in England in the latter part of the 19th century. He was extremely successful in his businesses and he heavily supported his local church. He also made donations to William Booth of the Salvation Army as well as to the evangelistic efforts of Dwight Moody. One day as they sat in church listening to a missionary from China preach on 1 Peter 1.16 which says, Be holy, for I am holy, something stirred deep within his soul. He sensed that God was leading him to a richer, fuller spiritual experience. He recognized that change, that is growth in grace, comes to those who spend time with Jesus and choose to allow him to transform their thinking. So that evening in 1882, he went home and wrote the, and wrote the old familiar hymn that we sing so often, Take Time to Be Holy. It's found in our Adventist hymnal, number 500. 
The hymn is the heart cry of a busy Christian businessman who longed to allow God to shape his thinking as he spent time in his presence. Every day and every hour, each one of us is being molded and fashioned after the world's model or after the image of Christ. Are we sure that we are following the right model? J.B. Phillips translates that verse, Romans 12, 2, as follows. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. <laughs> How do you like that? 2 Corinthians 3.18, I'm sorry, says, you know, you're to be, tra actually, let's just look at it. I think we have time. 2 Corinthians 3.18, all of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is a spirit, transforms us, notice that word, transforms us into his likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. The word transformed in that passage is metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is the word we use to describe the changes that take place as a caterpillar becomes a cocoon and then breaks out to become a beautiful butterfly. How could you guess if you looked at that caterpillar that it went into that cocoon that it was going to come out like that butterfly. These are not subtle evolutionary changes. When Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, he called it what? A new birth. We may wish desperately to have Christ-like characters, but if we are day by day filling our minds with this world's trash, the result will not be a Christ-like character. We cannot completely avoid exposure to this world, but we can minimize it, and we can maximize our exposure to the thoughts, ideas, and actions of Jesus Christ, as, and this must be a day-by-day -day experience. The pulpit commentary, thinking about some verses that talk about that, Philippians 2, 5, Romans 8, 5, and Colossians 3, 1 says, let this mind be in you, says, mind the things which the Lord Jesus minded, think the things which he thought, hate the things we hated, etc. That is our challenge on a day-by-day -day basis. Are we making an effort to try to be like Jesus? See you next week.